Hello and welcome to WRUWFM 91.1 Cleveland. My name is Matt Hook and you are currently listening to A Different Drum, where the more you love music, the more music you love. Today I'm joined by Mavs Maher, trumpet player for the immensely popular jazz fusion group Snarky Puppy, and a fantastic singer-songwriter in his own right. I was able to talk to him after his show at the Beachland Ballroom last Friday, where he played a fantastic set along with Michelle Willis and the Admirables. Thank you so much for joining me today, Mavs. Yeah, thank you, Matt. All right, now to give you all an introduction to his music, here is the song These Words off his last full studio album, Idealist. Well, I know about the cost of freedom And I know it's paying for our sins But ask me for a story
So that last song was These Words by Maz off his last album, Idealist, which was released last October. Maz first achieved success as the trumpet player for Snarky Puppy. So Maz, what inspired you to go solo after so many years playing in Snarky Puppy? Well, I think that it's always been a part, well, I know it's always been a part of my musicianship. Uh, it's kind of like a separate thing that is... Uh, well, not exactly growing. It's been kind of dormant in the last couple of years because of my involvement with Snarky. And I don't know, maybe it was just the timing of, of things that, that allowed it to, or that caused it to be dormant. But in terms of in, being inspired, for whatever reason, starting to develop and find more of an appreciation for songwriting in general. And having been a songwriter for most of my life and, and really wanting to follow that path and develop you know, my own voice in that realm. That's kind of the inspiration behind it. So when did you start writing songs? I guess I started when I was about 12. Yeah, playing guitar, playing with friends after school, and, you know, it naturally followed to just be fooling around on the guitar. And I used to write poetry a little bit. You know, um, I wrote, there's a, there's a couple of songs that I wrote from, back there that I, I'll still bust out every once in a while. Yeah, so around the age of 12. Who are some of your primary influences as a songwriter? As a songwriter, Pink Floyd, Steely Dan, Stevie Wonder, James Taylor, Joni Mitchell, Bob Dylan. You know, a, a very, not not a strange list in any way. Probably what, you know, the, the greatest songwriters of, you know, the, the 20th century, really. Um, especially in kind of, I mean, not, not necessarily Pink Floyd or, or Stevie Wonder or Steely Dan, but in the singer-songwriter tradition of um, having a song that stands on its own lyrically and harmonically without any sort of production frills, that, that's kind of where uh, I think would have been my, my main influences in that, in that realm. It, James Taylor was huge for me as a young person. My parents introduced me to him. I, I can remember riding around in a van with them and, uh, and listening to the James Taylor greatest hits, you know, before the age of 10, for sure. So you're really gravitated to those type of songwriters where if you take one of their songs and just have an acoustic guitar and a singer, the songs can still translate well. Yeah, I think, I think definitely I, I, I started with a, a good foundation of that. My grandmother is a is a singer um, and was kind of a folk singer songwriter type person, you know, not of any any note or fame, but that was her her connection to music and the way that she played music. My grandparents on my father's side are Irish, so there's there's kind of like that folk tradition of like sort of Irish, you know, I wouldn't call it singer songwriting necessarily, but Irish uh, folk yeah, Irish like folk songs and that kind of thing that that's kind of strong on my my father's side if I really investigate it but then as I've been getting back into songs and and writing more and really kind of studying the process of writing you know not instrumental music but songs you know with lyrics and forms my appreciation for a song that stands on its own like you said with just lyrics and and harmony and can be just sang with a guitar and still really have so much strength in it and so much intrigue in just the basic structure of the song. I've really started to, to uh, again, to have a deep appreciation for the mastery of that. So what do you think about when writing lyrics? Like, what do you look for for inspiration? I, you know, it's not a necessarily, I think the very, the foundation of it is not really a looking necessarily. It'll be an idea that comes to me very randomly. I don't, really write you know sometimes i'll do a little exercise and write a write a song or write about this pocket or this topic or or something just for an exercise but when it comes to writing songs for my albums it's it's personal you know it's the things that i think about you know on a daily basis on this album i noticed you're not really af you're not afraid to get political like that last song these words have Sure. Like socio-political messages and other songs like Bombs and Wine do as well. Were you a little mm -hmm. nervous when you first started putting out these kind of more political songs? 
Yeah, I definitely was. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, you, you don't really want to, it's, it's a thing that, that you, that you definitely think about because it's, it's not my intention to sort of, to assert any sort of, um, authority in terms of, you know, political thinking or anything like that or social thinking. Um, on the other hand, uh, I think also coming from that singer songwriter tradition, if you think about, um, music that was made in the sixties, um, or you think about Arlo Guthrie or Bob Dylan and their mastery of being able to really get you into that frame of mind while still, you know, not being divisive, you know, um, like being, I think that's why I called the album idealist because it, the, the word idealist has the connotation of somebody who has, you know, uh, sort of a, a dreamy idea of, uh, the possibilities for say society or a life. Um, but at the same time, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's a little, you know, naive or childish, <laughs> you know, it's not necessarily a realist. So I'm kind of making fun of myself at the same time, but, but I do think it's, I think during the writing of this album, even just from a natural standpoint, I, I really felt that there needed to be more, there needs to be more introspection and social commenting happening in art. And I felt like that's what I wanted to do, you know? Um, so I was writing these songs that, that, yeah, they're, if anything, I, hopefully it's just something that makes people think and, and make, and, and, or at the same time makes people feel like, you know, there's some art out there, or there's somebody out there that doesn't mind having these conversations in, in an open way, you know, yeah. as opposed to being just an entertainer or shying away from subjects that make people slightly uncomfortable or make people, you know, feel like it's not party time right now. Maybe we should sort of like think in a, you know, be a little bit more thoughtful with the art. Yeah, especially after such a divisive election season, it's good to have art that forwards dialogue. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, that's, you know, and and, and that's one of the things that I've talked about, you know, with, with people is that, you know, most of the writing of this album happened way before even, the, you know, the election season of last year got underway. Um, so I, I don't, I, I never really had... Um, any intention of writing as a reaction to what's happened over the past year. Um, but, but now that, yeah, it, 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 it's hard to tell, you know, what, what, what is actually happening, you know, with people on the ground, um, and what is just trumped up news stories, you know what I mean? But yeah, I find that when people talk one-on-one, -on -one, especially people who are, have different ideas about the way politics should be run, you know, one one on one in, in a respectful way, and try to solve problems. You know, for our whole society, I always feel good when when I have conversations like that. I always feel like I learn something from other people, and um, and I think it's a very healthy thing to do. And it's good to have conversations with people at the different side of the aisle because it's never good to put yourself in a kind of ideological bubble, so to speak. The th very interesting sure. thing is is that you're come from like the world of instrumental music where. A lot of times there is no political ideology or commentary in that. So was yeah. it was that another like kind of hard transition to make was from that world of instrumental music where the ideas that you're putting out are more abstract to singer songwriter where the ideas are there and easily read. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's that's the interesting thing is I think it, it for me it wasn't a, it wasn't a transition at all. You know, this is just stuff that you know if you were somebody who knew me for my whole life, you would know that this is a, a natural expression of things that, that I talk about all the time. Um, but I think for, you know, for the fans of Snarky Puppy, for example, who know me as the trumpet player in that band, it might be a surprise, you know, and, it, and I think it's the, the way that the music is structured is, is a whole different thing. And that's one of the things that I, that's one of the reasons why I really felt like I needed to pursue this because it's such a joy for me to be able to go into a completely different direction. You know, the snarky puppy thing has been such a blessing and I love those guys and I love the music and I love playing trumpet in the band. This part of my personality has always been there, you know, and it's just getting a chance to be expressed now through this, through these 
albums and, and, and through this touring and, you know, all of this. So speaking of Snarky Puppy, I wanted to play a cut off your last album, La Cachula Vo- Vo- Vocha. That's a tongue twister. Cachula mm-hmm. Vocha, yeah. yeah. So that song you just heard was Tarova by Snarky Puppy during Maz on Trumpet. Maz is right here joining me today. Now that Snarky Puppy song definitely has a much different character than your solo work, which I find really cool how you're able to be very versatile as a musician. So I was wondering, can you describe how a Snarky Puppy was originally formed? Yeah, it's pretty... Uh... So it's a pretty. It was a pretty natural process, you know. Uh, most of us went to school together at North Texas University. So when you go to a music school, you, you know, generally, naturally, you play with the other students that are there, and try things out. You know, try compositions and try getting a gig at the local pizza place or the local coffee shop, and um, just kind of trying things. So this snarky puppy was Mike Leagues. Uh, plan and and trying things and uh you know that was around 2004 10 years of touring and and growing and trying and experimenting later 
you got a whole different thing, you know? Very marinated sound. Puka Vuka was your first studio album in eight years. All your previous efforts over that period of time were live albums. Was it hard transitioning to studio-focused work after really being focused on touring and gaining a really cool live sound? No, it, it was uh, it was pretty pretty natural. I think there were some some ideas that there were some some concerns that had to go into the the planning of what type of sound we wanted, um, you know, and, and what recording engineer and and mixing engineer and uh, studio we wanted to use, and I know those those being Mike League's decisions. He's been doing you know production work for for all these years for different artists, so I know he's been honing his skills in that way. Um, but the process of doing live albums is much. It's really much more kind of nerve wracking and and difficult and and you know, energy consuming because there's so many things that need to come together. When you're recording an album, you have time in between takes and in between overdubs and the whole process is much more relaxed than doing a, a live in studio performance. So it was really, you know, the transition just felt like a, like a relief to a certain degree. So who are some of your primary influences as a trumpet player? Well, Miles Davis for sure. Dizzy Gillespie, Lee Morgan, Roy Hargrove, Dave Douglas, Louis Armstrong later, you know, and then even not so much on trumpet, guys like Joe Henderson and John Coltrane. I think that'd be about it, you know, from a horn player standpoint. Again, kind of the usuals. All those classic jazz horn players. So right. Now, you guys have been touring for a long time, and I was wondering, are there any experiences that you've had on tour that have really stuck out to you? So many. Too many to really talk about. (laughs) I mean, we're talking about, you know, we're talking about more than 10 years of touring. I mean, we've talked about writing a book about it. Um, There's there's so many. There's, you know, it's it's been lifetimes of experiences. so I, I don't even think I could, if I said one thing now, it you know, there would just be a, hundreds of other experiences that would follow that would, it would be equally as stand out, you know? Uh, if you say, so you can't really name one thing or else we'll just go on a tear and we'll be here for another three hours. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm saying. <laughs> So would you have any advice for musicians just starting out and trying to develop their own sound? Yeah, I I mean it's just like anything else. You know, it's just time spent. That's that's kind of the the message, you know, of the of the experience and of that I've had with Snarky Puppy and also the experience that I'm having now. Kind of in a sense kind of reliving some of these experiences that I had with those guys years ago, you know. Um, it's just time spent, you know, in evaluating, um, along the process, what works and what doesn't and continually returning to, uh, your focus of what you want to achieve in terms of an artistic vision and and in terms of a sound. And, and that will naturally adjust over the years, but there's kind of this underlying, aspiration i would say that that to a certain degree stays the same so basically just remember why you got into music in the first place and use that to motivate you absolutely yeah and i think the people i i've you know i've had a lot of experience now with with lots of people in the music industry and you can kind of tell you know the reasons why people do it pretty quickly and people have all sorts of different reasons. You know, some people are really in it for the art and some people are in it for, you know, for other reasons, for commercial reasons or for to be in, to be just to be on stage, you know, which is all good. But um, I think the people that I gravitate towards are, are the people who are really in it for the art and for the expression and the creation of new, exciting things within the music. I want to play one other song from your 
last solo album. This one is called Arizona. Two of us 
So that song was Arizona by Maz. Again, thanks so much for joining me today, Maz. So I was curious, what inspired that song in particular? Yeah, that's not, well, it, it kind of started out as, uh, <laughs> you know, you'll do a, I'll do a songwriting workshop clinic or whatever with this person or that person. And, and, uh, the question sometimes is what came first, the, the, the music or the lyrics. And for that song, it, it was the music. Um, but as I started sort of feeling how the, the music felt, it started to, to make me sort of have this, this feeling of, uh, the desert and of kind of driving around, um, you know, with the sun in your face. Um, and, and as that, progressed I started thinking about times when I've been driving around with my dad just talking about stuff talking about everything really so the lyrical content started to follow that theme so it's really about it's it's kind of about you know driving around and and having you know serious conversations about life with with someone else and in my life I definitely get that from my dad so it's um you know, it's kind of, in a, in a sense, it's kind of uh, uh, dedicated to him. And we both like the climate of Arizona <laughs> for some reason. So that's where the title came from. So when you write a song, do you usually have the music first and then add lyrics? Or do you have lyrics and try to put the lyrics to music? I would say more often than not, for me, it's, it's actually music first. But it, it's changing as time goes on as I'm thinking a lot more about lyrical content now than I used to. So it's, it's, uh, it's definitely changing, but it may, maybe it'll make a, a full switch, but currently it, a lot of times it, uh, in the, well, yeah, for the last couple of records, it was music first. So do you have any, uh, closing statements you'd like to make for our listeners? Closing statements? No. <laughs> No, I don't think so. <laughs> no prepared uh, closing statements or anything. But uh, yeah, it was good. it was good to to have some time to talk about this stuff with you. I appreciate it. Yeah, man. Thanks again for coming down again. That sure. This was an interview with Mass May here, originally from Snarky Puppy. His album Idealist was released last October. You can find it on iTunes, Amazon, and all the other music streaming sites.